If you want to learn how to make Ghibli style textures in Substance Painter, the latest course from the 3D coloring book was made for you. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to consider getting the course. Now let's get into this week's video. Hi, my name is Alexia Housden and I'm an environment artist currently working at Climax Studios. In this video, I'm going to show you a breakdown of my texturing process for my latest stylized diorama, Marketplace. So the technique that I used for this particular project, uh, it was all done in Substance Painter and Photoshop. Uh, so I used Substance Painter for the base colours, uh, the light information and uh, general ambient occlusion. Then I exported that texture from Substance Painter to Photoshop to add all of the lines uh, and any further sort of wear and tear that the concept showed me to do. Uh, so in Substance Painter, I uh, go to File and select the mesh that I wanted. In this case I'll be using the vending machine uh, from the concept half of the diorama as an example uh, and then I set the resolution to 4k. Uh, I do all of my substance painter in 4k purely just because it's a lot easier to down res than it is to up res and then we come with this and at this point I want a few things set up in my scene. I can turn off the transparent layer of my vending machine because I did that material solely in uh, Unreal Engine. So I can turn that off so I can see what's underneath. Uh, then I can get rid of metallic roughness, normal and height because I'll only be doing base color information in this project. And, and because of that, I can also change the viewport setting to base color only. And at the moment you get this sort of checkered um, base like you would in Photoshop. Uh, and that's what you can see here, it's got a layer. So I can delete that as well because we don't need that. And now, we can also set up the bake the mesh maps. So this will not, this will give you all the information that I'll need for the light information and the ambulant occlusion. So I can turn off ID because I don't need an ID map. Uh, keep all of these on. I'm going to change the output size to 4K to match the resolution of my document. And then because I don't have a high poly mesh, I'll use the low poly mesh as high poly mesh and just make sure that's ticked. And all of this should be fine. And I just bake the Fong 1 mesh maps. I don't need to bake all the texture sets because that would do the transparent as well. But seeing as we don't need that, I don't need to bake all of the texture sets. So we'll just bake that, give it a sec to whirl in the background. And momentarily we should have all of these maps uh, just get generated in the background and it means that when we use generators, uh, which I'll show in a minute, it means that um, all the information is already in the program and we don't have to do any further work to get that information. So the first thing that we do is we get a base layer. So what we do with that is we get the fill and we just fill it like that and it automatically gives you a sort of grey colour. Um, just switch that to the material part. Here you can find the base colour. So we'll just click that and then find a decent colour that we want for the concept. Uh, now I won't be matching uh, what I did originally uh, in the diorama, but for, per for this purpose we'll just pick that colour. Okay, so I like to keep all of my layers um, written up in uh, in the correct forms just so it doesn't get too confusing especially when you've got loads and loads of layers it can get really confusing if you just called them layer one layer two layer three uh, and then at this point we're going to add uh, another fill layer and this one i'm going to name light and what we'll do is we'll come to come to this add mask add a black mask which basically just gets rid of it so we've masked out that grey uh, and then we're going to add a generator so we add effect add generator and you can see this has popped up here so then we click that add light and now it's given us the grey from a certain light direction and obviously we want to pick uh, the light coming from a directly above so we're going to alt click this mask and what that does it just solely shows the mask information of this generator or whatever layers you've got on that mask and then we're going to click light and now you can see some more parameters have shown up so at the moment the horizontal angle of this light mask is coming directly down 
there but vertically it's at an angle which you can see why we've got the light coming from this direction and we want it coming like that so we're going to just put that down you could be more precise about it but I normally just eyeball it and just go like that uh, and I'm still not quite happy with this weird sort of light effect that we have happening here so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fiddle with some of these so that you can see it's the height uh, highlight glossiness uh, if I just increase that it gets rid of that um, sort of rounded um, part just at the front there so it doesn't really matter how much you do it but obviously the further I go up it gets rid of the angles so I still want light on some of these angles but I don't want it on everything so we'll just put it to about to about there probably yeah so that catches all of the back half as well quite nicely and all of the curves and everything so we can keep that like that uh light saturation that just is how bright everything is i try to keep everything at the brightness it can possibly be um just so that it so that the when you apply the color it really pops now at this point we can alt click onto the color and that will take it back to the original view now it's at this point um, that you have a decision to make. So normally what I do is I, because this is a light layer, I normally go to the blending mode and then go to, if I can find it, color dodge. Uh, and that basically just does a lighter version of whatever layers underneath it. And I tend to work with this because that means that you get a consistency in your colors. And it means that if I wanted to, I could come back to the base layer, click the color, and then do any one I want. And you can see that the light color is just following whatever I've chosen. So that is that. Or if you wanted, you could change that back to normal, go into this, and then change the color physically to whatever you wanted. That is also an option, uh, but I find it easier um, if I just put that back to it's usually around there somewhere, isn't it? If I just press that and yeah, just set it to color dodge and that does it perfectly. So now what we need to do is we've got the light information um, and now we need to do the underside information. So we'll create another fill layer and say dark we'll name that dark uh, and then we're going to add another black mask add another generator add another light generator specifically um, we're going to switch the view to only seeing our mask again you can see it's done the same thing and now what we do is that we change the vertical angle to the opposite and now this one will be doing everything on the underside so you can see it catches all of the um, all of the information like this. So again, we're just going to have to go in and change these settings so that they fit a bit better. Put the attention down and I'm happy with that. So we'll call that done and we'll alt click back onto the color. So now this bit is what we do is again, you've got two options. You can go do the normal color route if you want to do that. Or what I personally do is I just change that to multiply and there you go. So this is like a really simple way of doing um, base colour tones as like a base to get going or for other things. So at this point, what I would normally do is group all of these, which I think is Alt G or you can just hit the folder and then drag and drop everything in. And then what I'll do for this one, because we don't want the whole vending machine to be red, is that we'd add a mask to the folder. And then I'd go up to this button, which is polygon fill, select the um, either the polygon fill or the mesh fill. And in this case, I'll show you what both look like. But if I select mesh fill, make sure that this is at white and then just select the part of the mesh I want red, it will automatically just mask that out according to um, the mesh that you created in whatever 3D modeling software, in my case Maya. Um, and if we wanted a bit more selective, you can either click on the mesh uh, inside the wireframe that you can see that's overlaid, or you can go to the UV selector and just drag your cursor over select parts of it and then that will do that um, but in this case uh, since this is just a tutorial I will just clear all of that 
uh, go to Mesh Fill and just click that part. Now if we click off the mask and back onto uh, the preview, that wireframe disappears and we can have a look at what it actually looks like. So that's pretty good, but it's also not quite uh, at the stage that I wanted it to be. So what we'll do now is we're going to add an ambient occlusion layer. So I'll do another fill layer and I'll set this one to multiply already because we know that we want it to multiply exactly the way that our dark layer does. We just want it to do it in specific areas of the mesh. So at this point, um, I tend to use smart masks that Substance Cater comes with and I use the dirt cavities, but you can use any of these. Um, dust occlusion works well. Um, I personally made a smart mask myself because this is the one I use for most of my projects, but I'll do it the long way so that you guys can see. So take dirt cavities, we just place that on there. And uh, just for preview, that is what it looks like at the moment, which is not obviously what we want. So instead, we'll click back on the mask, which brings up um, the layers it has. We'll get rid of the sharpen because we're not bothered about that. We'll click this mask builder and this has come up with some options. So at the moment, um, it's literally just a case of fiddling with some of these um, options. Now, I'm not sure I really like the lines that is coming on the edges, uh, which obviously is not what we want. So I'm just going to switch to the mask view and um, I'm not sure why it's showing the edges as cavities for some reason. So we're going to go back into there. Uh, first of all, I should really get rid of the grunge because obviously we don't want any grunge. Grunge. Um, oh yeah, I'm just going to put down the scale. Grunge off. We don't want grunge. Curvature. Oh, this. there we go. We'll take the curvature all the way down so it only gets those nooks and crannies that we want that AO naturally provides. And so it's a bit it's a bit wishy-washy at the back, but we don't have to worry about that because that gets hidden in the diorama anyway. So we don't have to worry about that looking great. Uh, we can up the contrast if we wanted, so that brings a few bits of the cavities into play a little, but I'm not sure I like how hard that cavity specifically is. So I might just bring this down as it doesn't change it. So I find it easier when you're working with stuff like this is to play around with it a lot. Um, I mean, I could spend 10, 20 minutes just toggling all of these bars just to get the exact thing that you want. Um, but I'm happy with that because ambient occlusion shadows tend to be soft anyway. Um, so that is something that we can work with. Now we'll go back to the preview and uh, now you can see that there is a very slight sort of tonal um, difference in the edges. It just makes everything look a lot more realistic uh, stylized wise. And uh, if I just toggle this on and off, you can see the subtle difference that it makes and how much better it looks for it. Uh, now, if you're not happy with how dark it is, obviously you can just go in um, and then using this slider, you can just make it darker so that you can see the differences making it a bit darker would be. Um, or you can try use a different smart mask filter and that might have a few different results. There is some, like loads and loads of ways to do exactly the same thing in Substance Painter. It's one of the beauties of using this software. Um, you can do the same thing a million different ways um, and have a million different results. It's really just a case of what you find easiest to produce. So it's at this point really, um, that I'm looking for further details. Now, for this vending machine and this specific project, I didn't want to add any further details in terms of uh, Substance Painter. I pr pretty much purely use this software just to get a base for my machine. Um, and then I did all the details in Photoshop. Now usually I would make an effort to optimize the way I group my meshes and make sure that my UVs are all 
optimal and uh, all laid out very well. However, this diorama was all about getting back to basics with stylized art for me. So I bunched together a few of the bulkier assets like the vending machine and the display cases, etc. Uh, all into this one sheet, which I named Assets 1. And then I had some a few of the smaller ones into a sheet named Assets 2 and so on and so forth. So after each of the meshes had been through Substance Painter, uh, I brought in the exported texture, um, just cut away everything else around it. Uh, and then I started adding the details. So if we take the front of the vending machine, um, so what I'd done in this case is I added a simple brown strip to the bottom of it in Substance Painter. And that's pretty much the extent of the detail that I added in that software. Um, and so what I did is I added some details like some uh, wear and tear. And this is from the concept. So this is pretty easy for me to produce and just some like nails uh, just to give that sort of like metallic general industrial look. And I did have a line art layer that I did produce. And this was literally just a case of um, just using the brush tool to just paint out lines on it. Um, and I did use the wireframe as well, which if I always import each wireframe for each of the meshes as a separate layer uh, so that I can toggle one off and on. Uh, it just makes it easier visually and to work with it as well. So you can see that I pretty much just traced over the wireframe lines um, with a black brush and that produced a really solid line art for me. But eventually I decided not to use the line art in the um, this project uh, and so I kept it I didn't want to delete it just in case I changed my mind later on uh, but I in the end obviously didn't use it uh, so I did this for every single one of the meshes and if I turn them all on like this you can see um, my very messily UV'd um, asset sheet however you can see that each asset now has some greater detail whether that be uh, just some like random different boxes of color um, some signage uh, from the concepts uh, or some like greater detail in like fabrics and things like that and then after I was finished with this I used a really handy filter that comes with X normal um, it was a dilation filter uh, so basically what I did is I just um, merged all of my folders down which uh, can easily be done by control E um, and then using filter X normal and then the dilation uh, I produced this so it just basically just bleeds out um, all of the information from here uh, and it goes outwards until it meets uh, the one next to it and it just produces this nice completed look to the texture it also helps when you bring it into UE4 or if you're only doing it in your 3D modeling software. It just means that you don't have like this white line around all of your um, all of your textures. And this uh, is just like a good habit to get into. Finally, we come to the last part of my texturing process, which is importing it into Unreal Engine 4. Uh, so in this case, um, as you can see, I've got a lot of different materials. None of this was optimized. This was all purely just for fun uh, and just making sure that I could stick to the concept as closely as possible. Uh, so you can see that I just made a simple material. Uh, so if we just open this, uh, it's a very simple material. I think the only setting that I changed was I made it two sides. I did. Um, I made the roughness uh, as one and I just imported a basic texture sample and plugged that into the base color. That is literally it. I didn't do any fan anything fancy with this. Um, my glass material, um, which I've named M white transparent, I just drag that here. Um, it's actually blue, so I should have renamed it, but I didn't. Um, so it's literally just a blue color. Um, the material itself was set to translucent, again two-sided, and then I just set the opacity at uh, 0.25. So it wasn't anything fancy. Everything was very, very simple, uh, which was the whole point of this project was literally just for me to get as close to the concept as possible, uh, to play around with my own ideas for the back half, um, and then, uh, yeah, just see how well I could do it really um, and I am very pleased with how it came out um, obviously there's uh, there's always something you could do better um, and I think in the future I think it would be nice to uh, perhaps use a bit 
more detail in certain things and I maybe even use some of the line art next time um, but yeah that's pretty much it for this and uh, yeah so thanks for watching